Hi there! The video you're about to watch is part 3 of my 4 part gouache series and this video is going to be a painting demo. It's going to be a step by step breakdown of me painting a landscape with a reference picture. I wanted to quickly let you know that this painting demo is sped up. However, I do realise that having a real time version of this kind of painting is very useful. So I have created a real time version of me painting this landscape and you can find that video in the link below in the description. This real-time video does not have any voiceover or commentary or explanation, so I recommend watching it in conjunction with the video you're about to watch right now, but I figured I would provide you with both options in case you wanted to combine them. As always, you can find a free downloadable worksheet in the description below that breaks down all the steps I talk about in the video as well as all the supplies that I'm going to be using and such information, and you can also find a link to the reference photo I used if you want to use it also. If you have any questions at all, I would be more than happy to try and answer them in the comments, so don't hesitate to ask and leave me some feedback. And with that said, enjoy the video! Hi everyone, and welcome to the first demo of this series. So in this video, we will be painting a landscape together and putting into practice the techniques and exercises we talked about in the previous videos in the series. We will be using this reference picture from Unsplash, taken by Dominic Inman. You can find a downloadable version of it by clicking on the link next to this video. I chose a landscape for this first demo for a reason. Gouache is a very popular medium for painting outdoors and on the go. It dries fast, is easily portable and is convenient to use. It's a fantastic tool for painting quickly and it allows the artist to put down an impression of a scene or a sketch of a concept down easily and efficiently. It has long been used to work on the go by many artists and in this video I wanted to demonstrate a little of its potential as a sketching and practice tool. Gouache is perfect for quick studies and in this demo we will focus on understanding the key elements of the scene we will be painting and figuring out how to translate them to paper in an efficient, simple and appealing way. I have done my best to film my process and walk you through all the steps as I go along. I tried to film my palette as much as I could, but as I don't have a second camera, it is sometimes out of frame, I'm really sorry, but I will make sure to let you know exactly what I am doing as I am doing it. But of course, before we start painting, here's a quick overview of the supplies I will be using for this piece. I will be painting on a sheet of Strathmore Series 500 cold press watercolour paper taped onto a board and I will be using a few different Princeton brushes including the Velvet Touch flat shader and the Umbria flat, three angle brushes and one thin round Velvet Touch detail brush. For the paints I will be using the colours in the basic kit we put together in our first video and I'll walk you through each colour I use while I paint. I taped my paper to a board to make sure it will stay as flat as possible and won't buckle when I add water to it. It also helps create a clean border around my painting. You can use any low tack tape you have from regular masking tape to washi tape or painter's tape. I personally like to use painter's tape which has a slightly higher tack than masking tape and to avoid my paper ripping when I remove it at the end of my painting process I use a hairdryer to soften the glue first. So before we start the painting itself, I quickly want to review the image we will be using as reference and break it down into its key components. Doing that will allow us to better understand what we are painting and plan a little bit ahead of time to make sure that we hit everything that needs to be hit on to make the piece work. Part of why I chose this picture is because its composition is quite simple and straightforward, there aren't too many different elements going on, everything flows together nicely and the perspective is fairly uncomplicated. So let's break down the image into one, its composition and two, its value areas. The composition of the whole piece, like I said, is rather straightforward. The foreground is clean and simple. The middle ground is where most of the details are and where we will probably be focusing most of our attention, but thankfully we won't need to be extremely delicate or precise since this is a forest and we can get away with quite a lot so long as we respect our values and our shapes. So This is where the biggest range of values will be and where most of our detail will be. And then the background is faint, undefined and very bright, which makes it easily identifiable and fairly straightforward to paint. 
Now, the values in this piece are also rather easy to pick out. A useful thing to do whenever you want to work from a reference or from life is to determine early on where your darkest darks and your lightest lights are in your subject. Once you have figured those areas out, you can make sure that you don't go as dark or as light anywhere else in the painting, which will allow you to have accurate values in your piece, which will help with overall readability. In this particular image, it is easy to tell that the darkest darks are on the border between the middle ground and the foreground. So there's a little bit of it here, but mainly it's these parts here. So these are our darkest darks. The lightest highlights are mostly the background, so this big panel here, obviously, is very much our lightest area. It really radiates light and we really want to capture that when we paint it. A little bit of this here. And there's a tiny few elements in the foreground and middle ground, like these patches of light here, that can also qualify as being some of our lightest highlights. So once we know where those extreme values are, we can make sure to map them out in our sketch. This image will allow us to practice a few of the techniques we talked about in our previous video. The background being as light and undefined as it is can help us practice washes, whereas the foreground here, for example, the bushes here, the patches of light and the shadow, um, all these things will be great for practicing opacity and painting light on dark. The piece being in itself made up of different patches of different colors is perfect for gouache and the overall color palette can be easily mixed from our basic kit without too much mixing or at least none too complicated. Okay, so now let's jump into the painting itself. So here I am sketching out our reference image onto our paper using a brown coloured pencil and using fairly light lines as I don't want them to interfere with my painting and also don't want the graphite to bleed. There is technically little chance of that happening overall and gouache is opaque enough to cover most lines but there's no harm in being cautious. The ratio of my paper is a little different to the ratio in the reference, so I am adapting the image to fit my paper size. I made sure to put down the key elements of the reference image, like the landmark trees, the sign in the background, and the road, so that the scene is still recognisable, but I'm not trying to replicate the scene down to the tiniest leaf. What I want is to put down a quick sketch of the image that captures its essential essence and mood. You can find a scan of my undersketch in the downloadable worksheet available with this course. So I have poured a tiny amount of each of our colours onto my ceramic palette, except for any reds, as we won't be needing any. Don't worry if sometimes with some colours, clear or yellow liquid comes out of your tube first. That only means that the binder and pigment have slightly separated. You can squeeze out the binder onto a towel to get rid of it and reach the pigment, or you can squeeze until you reach pigment and mix the binder and pigment together in your palette. Here's my prepared palette with, from left to right, ivory black, raw umber, raw sienna, burnt sienna, ultramarine blue and phthalo blue, titanium white, Payne's grey, cadmium yellow hue, and lemon yellow. I poured some of my titanium white in two different spots on my palette so that I have one spot to sample from to mix in with my colours, and one spot that I'll do my best to keep pure in case I want highlights. So our first step is going to be doing a very light, very diluted wash of our warm yellow, our cadmium yellow, all over the sketch except from the areas we have singled out as being our lightest highlights. We want to leave those areas free of paint so that the white of the paper shines through as no matter how pure your white gouache is, it will never quite match how bright your original paper will be. So the best way to get a brilliant white is to keep your paper as paint free as possible. For this underpainting, I'm using a medium sized angle brush and diluting my colour a lot so that I get a very liquid wash, almost like watercolour. This layer of yellow is going to set the tone of our painting. Our landscape is very bright and has a warm light seeping everywhere and we want that to show in our final painting too, so an underpainting will help set the mood. I'm not trying to make the layer very even and smooth as it will get covered up with a lot of paint later on, so it doesn't matter very much how even it is. Plus, the more random your textures look, the more organic they'll seem. 
Next, we are going to work on our darkest values and make sure to isolate them early on so that we know not to go as dark anywhere else in the painting. I'm going to use an opaque mix of paint grey and raw umber. I won't be using black for the time being as I want to keep it as a last resort in case those dark areas need to be emphasised even more, which is not something I'll be able to tell until the end of the piece. I'm using a smaller angle brush now, my Princeton Velvet Touch angle shader in one quarter inch, and I added a tiny bit of burnt sienna to warm the mix a little. I'm using the blade of the brush to create thinner lines and the flat of the brush for bigger strokes. If I feel like the paint is becoming too thick and the paper texture starts interfering with my flat wash, I dip my brush in water a tiny bit and mix in my paint. A quick note about adding lighter colour to your mix. Burnt Sienna, in this case, is a little lighter than raw umber and Payne's Grey, so I need to be careful when adding it to my mix as it will affect both the colour and the value of it. Adding lighter colours to your mix will not only change the colour of your mix, it will also lighten it, so it's good to go in carefully and only a tiny amount at a time. This is particularly important with gouache that has added chalk to it, since the chalk will whiten the paint, which will in turn affect the darkness of your mix. At this point, don't worry about adding in the tiny branches yet, what we want here is to lay down the bulkiest areas of our darkest darks. We will be able to go back in at the end of the painting for the tiniest details, it will save you from having to paint around them and it will make them more crisp that way. Now, mixing colours can be tricky with gouache, especially when you want to maintain a consistent colour throughout. I personally don't tend to worry about it too much, since I find that slight shifts in colour make paintings look more fluid and organic, but if you want to use the same colour mix over and over again, I recommend mixing a sizeable batch of your colour so that you have enough to cover the whole area you want to cover with your mix. Gouache, as most paints do, dries a slightly different colour to its wet state, so it can be tricky to match a new mix to an old one. I also recommend having a piece of paper you can swatch your colours on if colour matching is something you want to do. Here I am constantly mixing some more of my colour by sampling my paints and adding them to my existing mix. It isn't an exact science and some slight colour shifts can occur, but I personally like that in my paintings, but you might not, so I just thought I'd let you know that you do need to kind of think in advance about how much of a colour you want to be using. Our next step is going to be mixing some green for our leaves and bushes. I'm going to mix a basic dark leafy green using some raw umber and phthalo blue for our cool green base and adding in a tiny bit of cadmium yellow to warm up the mix and lighten it up. And also for warmth I'm going to add a hint of burnt sienna. This is a more muted earthy warmth than the yellow gives. Here's a green mixing tip. If you want to lighten your green when painting nature, use yellow instead of white. White will dull and make your green more pastel, whereas the yellow will lighten it and brighten it up, giving it more of a young leaf kind of green. If you want to darken your green mix and make it more earthy, adding some raw umber will do that. And then if you want it to look like the green of a leaf that is in its prime, plumpy and juicy, you can add a tiny amount of cool blue to make it richer. I'm going to be using this dark green as my base for mixing most of my other green hues. I used a medium angle brush to mix my main colour and now using my smaller angle brush I'm going to slowly add more yellow to lighten my green to paint the leaves that overlap with our background. Those leaves will have light shining through them so some of them will be very light and bright and some will be very dark in contrast. I started with a medium green mix adding some darker tones where I felt was needed and I worked light on dark later on to add some light green dots to create the illusion of the light shining through the leaves. The background, although very bright, still has a small amount of detail showing through, so I'm going to use a watercolour-like, very diluted mix of burnt sienna and some of my green to recreate the very light details we can see through the bright light. The leaves on the left side of the image are obviously much lighter and more scattered than the ones on the right side, so I'm going to work light to dark and create a first layer with my bright green, going in on the top with slightly darker variations of green to add depth. 
I'm deliberately keeping my stroke somewhat messy and random to mimic the organic look of the leaves and light. There is no need to be extremely precise here. Next, we are going to move on to painting the dead leaf covered taluses on the sides of the path. The light hitting the brown leaves creates this very warm orange brown colour that I'm going to match by using some burnt sienna. I'm diluting it with water to make it lighter. I don't want to use white as the white will just make the brown duller and I want this sense of bright orange coming through, which is easily achieved by letting the white of the paper shine through the pure burnt sienna. A yellow underlayer also helps to create this sense of warm radiating light. I'm using a small flat brush for this, but switch to a bigger flat brush to cover more of the sides of the road to basically create a second underlayer on top of my yellow one. I kept my strokes very rough to add texture and variation to my wash, as the sides of the path are very peppered with colour and texture. I also tried to make my strokes go in the sort of direction that my reference was, so for the path I kept my lines horizontal and gave them more of a curve for the size of the road to help with that sense of texture and flow. If I felt like the texture was too rough, I simply dipped my brush in a tiny amount of water and brushed it over my paint to blend it. The right side of the path is the perfect area to practice painting light on dark. There is a lot of detail and a lot of different values and texture, so we can play with paint opacity and mixes. I started by reinforcing the darks I had already painted, which is often required with gouache as darks tend to dry lighter, so touch-ups are often needed to get to the value you need. When painting light on dark, it can be easy to overestimate how light your next layer needs to be to stand out, as your paints will usually look darker on your palette. One of the tricky things about mixing colours on a white palette is that your light mixes will look darker on the palette than they usually will once applied to your painting, and vice versa, your darker mixes will appear lighter than they will once applied on your paper. It's a matter of experimenting and you do get used to it after a while. That's why you'll see me regularly tweaking my colour because they look different when applied to my painting, so I am changing my mix slightly to see if it works better. If you put down your darker values correctly in the beginning, no other mix you do after that should be as dark, so it should make it easier for you to mix your dark greens and still have them stand out against your dark areas. The right side bushes on the image are quite dark and the shifts in value are fairly slight, so I am starting with a layer of very dark green from the first green mix I put together. The ground and trunks behind the bushes are even darker, so I went in every so often with a dark brown mix to add depth among my leaves, also using the mix to add texture and colour variation to the ground. I make sure that colour isn't as dark as my darkest darks, and I added some burnt sienna to warm it up and make it a sort of middle ground between my darkest darks and the burnt sienna areas of my piece. The light coloured tree on this side is a tricky one. I don't want it to stand out as one of my lightest highlights, so I first painted it dark and went over it with a thick mix of white and greenish brown, letting it mix with the still wet dark brown underlayer to create texture. Because the two layers are very thick, they are creating a nice texture and slightly reactivating each other. I created some highlights with slightly tinted white also towards the end. As I go on, I lighten my dark green mix on my palette with some white to create some lighter leaves against my existing dark green layer. I use white instead of yellow because adding white to my mix will make my mix more opaque and will help my lighter colour layer on top of my darker layer better. There is no paper white left in that section to lighten my green, so I use white instead. Plus, all the leaves in that area are in shadow, and I don't want them to be as bright and warmly lit as the leaves in the background that are backlit, so I am only using the tiniest amount of yellow to warm the mix, if any at all. I also add some very dark green patches next to my lighter green ones to emphasise contrast and give a sense of shadow. Having a couple of branches lightly accented in the foreground can help add depth to the whole piece, so I'm going in with a few very opaque strokes of greenish white, adding a few dabs of brighter green to give those leaves more colour variation and accentuate the feeling of them being closer to the viewer. I then go in with some opaque white, tinted with some green and brown, to add highlights over the whole scene. 
I don't use pure white because those highlights are still pretty muted when compared to our brightest patches and since they're being added to already dark areas, the mix doesn't need to be very light to still stand out pretty significantly. Next, let's move on to the path. I am going to switch to a medium sized angle brush and I'm going to mix up a batch of brownish bluish grey using paint grey, phthalo blue which is our cool blue, some white, raw umber and burnt sienna. This part of the painting is where more analysis needs to go into understanding the colours that make up the path. It's easy to think that since the path is made of asphalt, we can simply paint it grey. However, the path is littered with debris and leaves, and is surrounded by warm colours and bright sunlight, all elements that will drastically affect the colour of the road. If we look closely, we can see that the path is in fact a very warm grey in the shadows, almost purple, and a light orange in the light. You may have noticed that I don't tend to clean my palette even if I am running out of space to mix. That's because I like having a little bit of all my colours echoed throughout the painting. I find that having a little of all of my colours in each mix I put together helps the piece look more harmonious and cohesive, especially when painting a landscape. I start by painting in horizontal strokes across the path to mimic its texture and I regularly use my loaded brush and I dip it into various different mixes on my palette. That allows me to create a streaky texture on the path made up of different colours I have used before throughout my painting. I make sure to avoid applying paint on the areas of the road that are in the sunlight to make sure to create a harsh contrast between the pools of sunlight and the shadow areas. I am not using my grey colour at its peak opacity and thickness as I still want some of the burnt sienna tone and yellow underpainting to peek through and lend the road some depth. Whenever I feel like my texture might be too harsh, I use a wet brush to blend whenever it is needed. The road gets lighter the closer it is to the viewer, so I gradually dip my brush in water more and more and dilute my mix more and more so that my yellow underpainting starts peeking through more decisively. I extend some of my grey colour onto the sides of the road to mimic the continuity of the shadows, making sure that I curve my strokes to follow the geography of the landscape. And then to add texture, I use a slightly damp brush with a very diluted version of my grey mix and paint a few vertical and diagonal strokes on my road to add some movement and direction to the path. Once my path is dry, I go back in with a lighter version of my grey base, just with some white added in, and add some subtle highlights. I also use some of my burnt sienna in the mix to extend the sunbeams that are coming off of the side of the road and have that orangey quality to them. Painting the left side of the road is fairly similar to painting the right side, aside from the fact that the value range is much higher, meaning that we have some very dark darks, but also some very bright areas right next to each other. I start in the same way I started the right side bushes, going in with my dark greens and layering lighter greens on top to add depth. Because some of the leaves are in direct sunlight however, some portions will be painted with a very bright green with a lot of yellow and white in it. I keep my paint opaque and don't blend to make sure there is a clear delimitation between my dark and lights, emphasising the feeling of harsh sunlight beams shining down in patches. Make sure to keep your darker greens to the areas in shadow, overlapping your bright green to add contrast and depth. To avoid your darker layers mixing into your lighter ones, only use tiny strokes and don't work your paint in and don't blend. If it is opaque and thick enough, a small dab will be enough. One of our last steps will be to add pure white highlights by taking a small clean brush and dipping it into a separate jug of clean water and an untainted sample of titanium white. It is important to be very partial with the white highlights as pure white is only for the highlights that are only the tiniest bit less bright than the exposed paper highlights. So I am applying only a few spots here and there strategically. If I want to add more highlights anywhere, I will go in with a very light mix of white and another color mixed in so that those highlights don't match my whitest white in intensity. As the background in this picture is blindingly bright, the light is eating away at the distant shapes of leaves and trunks and taking away their contour, so I'm going in with my pure white and adding dabs of white on top of the outline of those elements to make them look hazier and make it look like the light of the background is dazzling. <laughs> 
We are now reaching the end of the painting, so I've waited for the paint to dry completely so we can go in and make a few final touches. So I added a thin wash of burnt sienna to the road to warm it up a little, making sure not to overwork my strokes so as not to muddy everything by reactivating the previous layers. I also added a few opaque strokes of colour every here and there to add smaller detail and texture to the foreground, especially on the road to mimic debris and fallen leaves and branches. And I also went in with a very yellow brown and outlined some of the pores of light with it to brighten and warm those areas up. And then our very, very last step is going to be adding those thin tree branches we avoided in the beginning. I am going to switch to a thin round brush with a pointed tip and a dark brown mix. And keeping my wrist very loose and fluid, I'm going to add in very delicate branches in our background, keeping my lines inconsistent and erratic and taping them off at the end. A few light weeds on the side of the road and we are done. To be honest, I could keep tinkering till the cows come home, but it's important to know when to stop, especially with gouache, as you can quickly ruin everything by overworking your paint. Gouache is really great to work in layers, but only really to a certain point. The more layers of gouache there are on your paper, the more paint is sitting on top of your paper surface, and the more likely your paint is to reactivate even with very little water. That sweet spot of knowing when to stop can be difficult to gauge in the beginning, but if you feel that you are starting to struggle with adding things because your colors are muddying and sliding around, then that usually means it's probably a good time to stop. And there you have it, our forest path landscape in gouache. I hope this video was useful and interesting to you, and remember that you can take all the time you need and use whatever brushes and colours you think will make your practice more enjoyable. The learning process is about finding pleasure in the process rather than the result. Don't hesitate to share your creations with me in the workshop gallery if you have been painting along. Don't forget to download the worksheet that comes with this video if you would like to see everything we talked about in this session in writing, and I'll see you in our next and last video for another demo in which we will paint an eye. Take care everyone and I'll see you all soon. Bye!